on Off The Ball. With Gillette, for an effortless finish to your day. New Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. This is News Talk. Now we've got a cracking show for you this evening, so Caitlin Thompson from Racket Magazine is going to join us on the epic that was Nadal Djokovic at Roland Garros late last night, early this morning. Owen Redden, always uh, really smart taking the game. He's along for Wednesday Night Rugby. He's got an interesting uh, view on the European finale that was. So Owen Redden on the way on Wednesday Night Rugby. And then on the football show with the conclusion of another season, Graeme Hunter and Matt Slater will join us for a State of the Nation type stock take on where the game is. Graeme may be keeping one eye on Scotland Ukraine as well, which is very forgivable. 53106, the text number. We are at Off The Ball on Twitter. Now, much like uh, Nadal and Djokovic last night, we have two of the returning greats here on the news round. Two of the heavyweights. They are friends. They are rivals. They're back with us. Richie McCormack, welcome back. Joe, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Delighted to be back, obviously. Nathan Murphy, welcome back. Who's Nadal? Who's Djokovic? Well, took the words right out of my mouth. I don't know. I don't know. Nobody wants to be Djokovic in this conversation, nope, do they? No one's on, put their hand up for that one. <laughs> Who are we booing? Uh, it was quite Hopefully. something. Did anyone stay up for it? Hell no. As as I could. For as much as I could. Oh. I, but I think I was deep into the third set. Uh, but a day's travel had gotten the better of me. And I was just like, as good as this is, as much as I want to see these two lads hammer the ball back and forth at one another, <laughs> um, I think I should probably call it night. To be honest, I think I should have stuck with it. I was only, I think I counted this morning, nine games away. From actually seeing the end, I didn't. I genuinely didn't think they'd get it done in th- in four, uh, like they did. And uh, yeah, I kind of regret not seeing it out. If I'm being honest, yeah. because um, I think Colin mentioned it this morning on OTBM. I don't. There is a sense now, and there was a sense watching it, particularly from McEnroe and from um, the other Eurosport commentator Simon Reid, who was on last night as well, commentating on it. They were talking about there used to be like these boos for Nadal at Roland Garros in the sense that, like, oh God, do we have to see him win again? Um, and now there's this sense where, and it happens, I guess, with all professional sports people and all major sports people, that when you get to a certain age, there is this realization that you might not actually see them for that much longer. And we definitely don't know how long we're going to see Djokovic and Nadal as a, you know, as a rivalry for much longer. So there was a sense from everybody there that we're going to treasure this for as long as we have it. And long may this continue. I think they just would have preferred an extra set. It does seem as if Nadal could retire at the end of this tournament he is being patched up he has a chronic foot injury and your foot takes a lot of punishment I would think playing tennis for five hours at every turn and even in the warm-up event in Rome he was beaten soundly on clay and it wasn't looking good so he surprised quite a few people in coming back the way he has but he did say afterwards that his doctor is with him from Rome and it's day to day week to week no guarantees of playing Wimbledon he came back yeah well he came back, Joe, pretty he, quicker than I would have expected yeah. from that injury to begin with. I think that's, that should be one consideration when people are talking about his fitness here. Secondly, at the end of this tournament, like I wouldn't be surprised if he's not playing Wimbledon. There are a few factors in that. One, it's grass, and he might necessarily need the adjustment, quick adjustment that it is too, to go from being on clay to being on grass and playing at that level. There's the ranking points issue surrounding Wimbledon as well this year as a result of their ban on Russian players. So it's conceivable that he could win or could just finish up, however, however it turns out this week in Paris, that he finishes and can then take a, a six to eight month break to get himself fully back up to speed and then pop up again for, for hardcore tournaments in, in the winter yeah. and prime himself possibly for another Australia and bow out on his own terms, I guess, maybe in Paris next year or just keep going because he's a machine. He sure is. 59 times these two have played each other and it's uh, 30 for Djokovic, 29 for Natal. So it's extraordinary. Very, very frosty. Very, very. I hope that, I hope that would never happen with you two if you played a tennis match. It was very frosty over the net. So it seems they've never been the chummiest. We'll talk to Caitlin Thompson about this this hour. She's going to join us. It seems they've never been particularly uh, close and obviously Nadal coming out and saying he disapproved of the way Djokovic had handled the vaccine situation around the Australian Open has not really helped things and the fans equally booed Djokovic and even as he was walking off and on the tannoy they said Novak Djokovic everyone uh, he didn't even care to wave as they were applauding him off and uh, so it was uh, frosty on that front so there we are Caitlin Thompson with us half past seven to talk about an epic maybe the last time these two play in a Grand Slam we're all getting old it's interesting isn't it the development of the love for Nadal and maybe it is that 
up against Federer for so many years, he slides away and Djokovic is the replacement rival who's always going to be the bad guy. That Nadal, who was never a particularly bad guy, it wasn't good against evil when it was Federer against Nadal, but everybody just loved Federer to yeah. such an extent that if you were the guy trying to deny him, nobody was ever going to be on your side. Or actually, <laughs> suddenly Nadal uh, against Djokovic, it's, wait a second, yeah. I'm never going to cheer for Djokovic. And now Nadal is finally getting the love he deserves. And he's kind of like the king of Roland Garros. You know, they've taken him on as their own. I suspect they would cheer him on against a French uh, player at this stage. I hated Nadal so much when he came on the scene. When he came on the, the scene longevity. and started ruining... 17 years ah, when he since start, he won his first at Roland Garros. When he started ruining things for Roger, I really hated him. I thought, like, <laughs> the finesse and the class of Roger and you're just smashing the ball really hard and you, you're not a patch oh, 2008. Him. 2008, yeah. Wimbledon was the killer. Yeah, that was amazing. He's won me over, though. I mean, I was really rooting for him last night. Anyone that hangs around that long, kind of, they, gets under your, they get under your skin a little bit. And not only that, like, somebody who was initially... Not, I don't know, I wouldn't say dismissed, but there was a sense that he's only a, he's he, kind of like a Thomas Muster was in the nineties. He's somebody who can only play on clay, and he put that to bed fairly quickly yeah. in his career and proved that he can do it on all surfaces. And that's, I think, why there's been this slow acceptance to him is that we kind of thought him just as one of these kind of clay brats comes out of Spain. There's been loads of them from Spain down through the years. Your Carlos Moyes, etc. But he's somebody who can do it on all surfaces and can do it without being. Uh, as objectionable, let's say, as someone like Novak Djokovic, he, he might have his little quirks in terms of his amount of time that he takes to play a shot, but I don't think he's, he's someone like Djokovic and somebody that the crowd can rally behind hating uh, in so much as they do him. Yeah, he's won two Australian Opens, two Wimbledons and four US Opens to go with his 13 French Opens. And that was a real six-pointer yesterday in that Nadal on his 21 Grand Slams has a great chance of getting to 22 and Djokovic remains on 20. So it's all very interesting. And Nathan Murphy, before we get into the news round, Dustin Johnson. There was a time when Phil Mickelson's interview with Alan Shipnuck was released at the Riviera tournament and there was a, a rush by the likes of Dustin Johnson and Bryson DeChambeau, other players rumoured to be talking to the Saudis. There was a rush on their part to say, well, I'd like to declare my loyalty to the PGA Tour. And on that weekend back in February, we would have all said well, it's done. It's over. The Saudi thing is not going to get off the ground. Here we are several months later. Uh, money has talked. They have announced the uh, list of players who will partake in the very first Live Golf event in uh, next week. I, was gonna say, I keep saying in June, like it's so far away. Next mm. week. And who popped up the surprise inclusion? Dustin Johnson. So Dustin Johnson, who's been one of the best players of his generation, has decided that he is going to turn his back on all the traditions of golf and become essentially for the coming period the face of Saudi golf. Uh, this was something of a surprise when it came out last night because Dustin Johnson, what, three months ago, issued a statement saying, I'm staying. Uh, but something changed in the meantime. And it does seem that the number has been bandied about for Dustin Johnson because we are talking about one of the big guns. Remember, Dustin Johnson has spent more time as world number one than Rory McElroy has. He is one of the superstars of American golf. And the rumours are he's offered $100 million up front oh, to sign right. for Live Golf. So obviously with the fallout from initially Phil Mickelson's comments and then Greg Norman's comments, there seemed to be a reluctance from the top players to commit and maybe to just let it play out for a little while and a drip feed of top 30 players, top 40 players, and eventually one or two of them might go. But there were a lot of rumours around the PGA Tour last week that they were doubling down with their offers to the big names. And to put that in context, for just, even Dustin Johnson, Dustin Johnson has earned the third most amount of money in PGA Tour history. Only Phil and Tiger have earned more. He's earned $75 million in prize money. Okay. And he's been offered $100 million up front. And then you're going to be playing week in, week out for the biggest prize fund in golf history. So $4 million next week. And Dustin Johnson is by far and away the best player in that field. It'll be a shock if he doesn't win it and top that up again. So if those are the numbers, it's no great surprise. And in a way, Dustin Johnson... I would say it was their number one target in many ways because he's the perfect spokesman. Mm. He will say nothing, has never said anything. And when he's asked about human rights abuses, Jamal Khashoggi, Saudi Arabia, Dustin Johnson quite literally couldn't explain it, which is just what they want, I suspect. Mm. I saw his uh, sponsor, RBC, uh, withdrew their support of him. And my first thought was, honestly, do you think Dustin Johnson even knows that RBC sponsor him? Um, yeah, he's not going to care about a thing. He'll uh, swan on in there and it won't be worth follow-up questions with him. Uh, Craig and Tralee says, will the lads be watching the Live Golf Tour? What would it take? 
Craig, that's, I mean, we're still in the hunt to try and present the Live Golf TV coverage here. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's our dilemma. Do they have a TV deal yet? I've asked this before. Heard, don't, like, no, there, no. There wasn't talk uh, they were willing to hand it over to whichever UK broadcaster wanted to put it on free to air, which was a savvy move, I thought. It, there's nothing done yet. Uh, there's talk it might be available on YouTube. And uh, the TV deal and the lack of a TV deal sums up the greater business uh, issue around this as a rivalry for the PGA Tour. The PGA Tour, the European Tour, who are not perfect, but find themselves in a fight that is not fair. They've one hand tied behind their back because Saudi Arabia do not make need to make money. They're offering Dustin Johnson $100 million up front, putting on the biggest payday in golf history, have no sponsors, have no TV deal, and it doesn't seem to matter. So if that's the enemy that you're going up against is the PGA Tour, it's hard to see how you win. And this is an event in London. The best golfers in the world do not like traveling to Europe at the best of times. They just about drag themselves over for the Open. In a month's time, there's the first of seven events in the US. And then we may see a few more of the big names, possibly Bryson DeChambeau. And I think the worry is a golf fan away from the human rights issues from a purely sporting perspective is that is this going to be the dilution of golf so are we going to end up in a situation like boxing or maybe even darts for a while where the best players in the world are split over Mm. two tours three tours and don't face each other and suddenly we're going to the masters next year and if dustin johnson isn't there if Sergio Garcia, uh, Adam Scott, Charles Schwartz, all former champions, many of whom are a little bit over the hill. But if the young players start going, do we end up with not knowing who the best players in the world, uh, a sense that there's an asterisk around the majors? And I think that's maybe the initial concern from a purely sports watching point of view. No, very much so. I mean, it will come down to the J.P. McManus Pro-Am every couple of years to decide who the best player in the world is. It's the only time we're going to see them. <laughs> well, DJ is going to be there. DJ's who isn't? There. Who isn't? Who isn't going to be there? My goodness, it's ridiculous. So the PGA Tour, by the way, have reiterated their stance that PGA Tour players are not to play in this event next week in London. We don't know what the consequence of disobeying their request will be for all those PGA Tour players. So one suspects a very long, very dull and never-ending court case, to be honest. We should start the news round which is, as ever, with thanks to our friends at Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Richie, you are starting with the French interior minister. Quite the character. Uh, Yeah, both he and his uh, sports minister colleagues certainly were this afternoon. They both appeared in front of a Senate hearing in Paris with the French interior minister refusing to blame police for the events that marred the uh, preamble to Saturday's Champions League final. Gérald Dermaman told the Senate hearing that Liverpool fans were to solely blame, with 50 to 70% of their tickets claimed to be fake. Official numbers put that number at under 3,000, around 2,500. Dermaman said the use of tear gas by the French police was an attempt to avoid supporters being crushed. He claimed that between 30 to 40,000 supporters turned up to the Stade de France with either no tickets or fake tickets. How is he getting 30, 40,000? I'd be interested to find that out because um, like, his excuse afterwards when he was uh, queried on this by uh, different uh, senators, because obviously there was their speeches uh, and then there was a questioning from uh, senators on the floor and he was asked about that and he said eff- effectively that 30,000 or so people saw that they couldn't get in and then just hopped on Metro seemingly and went back into town with their tails between their legs. And, you know, you would imagine that there's CCTV footage to uh, essentially debunk that pretty quickly. Um, he Like, it's, it's numbers that have been fed to the French Football Federation as well. They claimed earlier before the Senate hearing that there were 110,000 people in and around the Stade de France on Saturday evening, which, again, is pretty easy to debunk. Mm. The issue is around fake tickets, and that's one that I think does stack up I'm not going to say in their favour, it's probably the wrong um, wording, but he did point out a statistic whereby one ticket in particular, let's say one ticket number, uh, was attempted to be accessed 744 times. So there was a problem with the issuing of fake tickets. Um, there were only but can we seemingly... believe that, Richie? Why no, would no, we believe no, we, that no, we... one bit of information when everything else that the French have said has essentially been a lie? Oh, it's been a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you there. The, the point is, 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 in more general terms, is that the paper tickets were seemingly only present on the Liverpool side. Darmanman said there was no issues on the Madrid side, and he put that down to them coming in solely with, you know, the QR code on their phone and that being the sole use of entry, whereby paper tickets were only being used on the Liverpool side. The, the, the stuff that was coming out of his mouth, though, as regards 
the crushes being for, like, caused by the extra 30,000 people is nonsense. Um, tear gas being used and deployed to avoid uh, crushing uh, by fans is just absolute nonsense. They're lying their way out of this because they got it chewing out by Macron in the wake of the events of Saturday night. And they know they've an Olympics coming up in a couple of years' time. And that's the big thing for them is that they know and they failed their biggest examination so far on the world stage is regarding staging an event and fail it pretty badly and want to keep up relations with police and police unions because that's a massive thing for them going into the biggest event the country has ever staged outside of a, a Tour de France, etc. They know that they have to keep everybody sweet in terms of uh, the French interior and pissing off a certain cohort of Liverpool fans. Um, they've got nothing to lose by doing that in their, in their eyes. Where's UEFA? Where are UEFA in Good this? Question. If the French are going to lie and lie, where is Seferin, who UEFA went along with the party line on Saturday night? I don't understand how there aren't serious question marks about his future as the head of UEFA when their standout day of the year is the Champions League final or the European Championship final. And both of them have been an absolute calamity that it is a miracle that nobody ended up being killed at one of them. And he has overseen this and they've just put an independent report in place just going to buy their time and are allowed their audience, their consumers, be slurred continuously by the French government and just let them away with it. Like The one thing that is absolutely clear out of this is that the only reason the catastrophe was avoided on Saturday night was because of the good behaviour of the Liverpool supporters and how they self-policed themselves. So for the French interior minister to be coming out again today and almost doubling down, I just find it absolutely outrageous. Yeah. And that UEFA are letting this happen and not saying whatever about the internal French politics that are behind this. And in fairness, I think all of the French ministers have been called up internally in the Senate saying like, nothing backs this up. There's not one ounce of evidence of, of the thousands and thousands of first-person accounts we've heard. None of them back any of this up. So I, I can't understand how UEFA haven't come out to defend the Liverpool supporters and admit themselves if they got it wrong that they didn't keep on top of the French authorities in the way that they should have. Mm. But otherwise, it doesn't feel as though there's going to be any lessons learned at all. I wouldn't think so. Kicking for touch, Theo, we've commissioned an independent report. Get Sue Gray in here. I mean, that generally just lets everything calm down for a couple of weeks is the policy. Now, Manchester United fans, there's talk of statues too to be built, Richie, for departing <laughs> yeah. heroes. The clear out of Manchester United gathering pace today, Joe, the club, confirming that both Jesse Lingard and Paul Pogba will leave when their contracts expire at the end of this month. Pogba rejoined United for a then world record fee of €110 million Euro in 2016, while Lingard has been with the club since the tender age of seven. They won't get a penny for either of them. Nathan, how will we remember the Pogba-Lingard era at Manchester United? Oh, God, uh, the Pogba era. <laughs> The Pogba Lingard here, I said. The Pogba Lingard. Sorry, the Pogba. Era. Well, well, Jesse did leave once before and went off and had a thoroughly good time. Yeah. I remember the start of the season when Manchester United destroyed Leeds and Paul Pogba had four assists in one game. We thought, this is the season. I know. The Came France, the last France year, Pogba has returned, we said. On, uh, and you know, gets an injury. Was he that injured? Nobody was quite sure. There's always been, obviously, a, a total lack of trust in Pogba around English football. That was at times a tad harsh, but this season. Every bit of criticism he got, he thoroughly, thoroughly deserved. Went missing in the few games that he did play, like the oh, the game against Liverpool when he comes on, the match against Leicester when they were hammered. Like, it's countless, the amount of matches where he just disappeared. And it's a shame because we do look at him last summer for France and think, if this guy on his day is maybe the best midfielder on the ball in world football. But he obviously didn't have the personality that he could raise players around him. And that's what's often said, that, you know, he's a player who makes good players look even better, but isn't someone who's going to make bad players better. And unfortunately, at Manchester United, there's a lot of bad players. And his demeanour, more than anything against, counted against them. Yeah, very much so. Richie, I think we're safe in saying very charged emotional atmosphere coming up this evening. Yeah, Ukraine returning to international football tonight for the first time since Russia's invasion of their country. They take on Scotland at Hampden Park in a World Cup playoff. Wales await the winners in Cardiff on Sunday. Kickoff is at 7.45. That is going to be extraordinary, Nathan. Yeah, it's a, it's incredible that Ukraine are in a position to play these matches. I thought when they were rescheduled a few months back that unfortunately you'd be in a situation where Ukraine still wouldn't play. But I think it's obviously a, an act of resistance that, yes, while the Russian invasion continues, that they cannot break the Ukrainian spirit and the Ukrainian players obviously want to go out and represent their country. 
again, on just a sporting point of view, it's a very difficult situation for Scotland to find themselves in because this is a place in the World Cup finals that's at stake. Mm. And they know what's in it for Ukraine, what it would mean to the Ukrainian people as much as Scotland would love to get back to a World Cup. Like this would mean so much for Ukraine to go and win this game tonight. And then for Ukraine to try and somehow manage their emotions, watching Alexander Zinchenko in the press conference yesterday, like he was struggling during that press conference. I'm sure the anthem tonight where I think there's talk of the Scottish players singing the Ukrainian anthem as right. well. Right. Uh, I'm, it's going to be a pretty powerful evening. And obviously Ireland play both Ukraine and Scotland mm. uh, next week as well. But it's great that they're in a position to play this game. You, you just hope that both of them can go and actually play the way they want to. Sarah Inklandokan with Question of the Week by text. If Nathan could banish one PGA Tour player to the Live Golf Tour, who would he be happy to see oh, the back of? Great question. That's a great good question. question. <laughs> you see, one of them is gone, Kevin Nah, who's somebody who'd be at top of many people's list because he's just the slowest player. Uh, Keegan Bradley would be up there. Oh, yeah. But I think, and it's going to happen, I think Bryson. No. Do you not want to keep Bryson? It's just... I, I don't. I wouldn't miss Bryson. He's just an oh. unnecessary sideshow. What you need unnecessary sideshows. You've got a. Uh, you've got a podcast to maintain. You need to talk with people. Yeah, I'd keep Bryson for box office. I'm torn I between a text saying Patrick Reed. Oh no, I want Patrick Reed as well. well again, I like. I, I don't mind Patrick. I, I like the little bit of cheating adds a little something every now and then. Absolutely, a bit of jeopardy in there. I'm torn between Sergio, who I think is going to go anyway, just uh, for his. He's I, gone. Chip on his shoulder. He's gone. He's in the field. Woe is yeah. me. His kind of woe is me uh, lack of charisma vibe that he seems to bring on the camera every time he plays for the last decade is is, is tiresome. And then I suppose Scotty Scheffler. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> this might be news to uh, anybody who doesn't listen to Golf Weekly, but uh, Scotty Scheffler, the world number one player, just beaten by a playoff again last week, was having one of the great, great seasons in PGA Tour history. Just not quite convinced. Absolute snooze fest. What have you done for me lately, Scotty? He's just really boring, though, isn't he? Absolutely. The he's the most boring world number. He's a, it's, it's, it's a disaster for the sport to have Scotty Scheffler as the world number one. As opposed to Dustin Johnson. Why? Well, I, I just. Yeah, as opposed to Dustin Johnson. Like, there's a, no, there's, a, there, there's a bit of showbiz to Johnson's stupidity. <laughs> there, like, there really is. Like, well, a, he's there's married a to Pauline. Paulina Gretzky, Wayne Gretzky's daughter. That, that, uh, there's also yeah, another side to. You know, if DJ suspended for the PGA Tour, it may not be the first time because, uh, you know, he had a you know, bit of indulgence, maybe a night in Vegas that he shouldn't have had uh, that got himself in a bit of trouble. Yeah, there is a bit of X factor There's a bit of rock and roll there. around DJ. There's a bit of Tim Nice but Dim. But I say that, and we're all very harsh on DJ, and we had his coach Claude Harmon on when he won the Masters, and he said he is without question the greatest mind in golf, the greatest golfing mind. That's true. I think he called him a golfing savant. Mm. So... Sit on that, Richie. Think about that. Um, <laughs> where are we going next? Uh, Wales have warmed up for that playoff final with either Scotland or Ukraine with defeat in their opening Nations League game. Uh, despite taking a second half lead through Johnny Williams, they went down 2-1 away to Poland in Rotswav. Uh, Andrew Rublev and Marin Cilic are tied at two sets apiece in their French Open quarter final. Uh, Cilic is 5-4 up, but it's still going with serve in the decider. The semi-final lineup will be competed later. Kasper Rudd takes on the Danish teenager Holger Rune. Earlier, Igor Sviantek booked a second Roland Garros semi-final in just four appearances. The 2020 champion and world number one beat Jessica Bagula in straight sets to set up a semi-final with the Russian Dazia, Daria Kazakina. The 25-year-old reached her first ever Grand Slam semi by beating compatriot Veronika Kudermetova 6-4, 7-6. Guys, we are just out of time. My thanks to you both. Nathan Murphy, thanks, Mill. Thanks, Joe. And Richie McCormack, thanks, Richie. Nice, lads. The News Round on Off the Ball. With Gillette, for an effortless finish to your day. New Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar.